in 2010. <laughs> maybe, maybe give everybody just a little bit of a background of, of where Grace was, right? Prior to the IoT kind of movement that, that we kind of began together in, in, in the 2017, 2018 timeline. Right. So so Grace really started off as uh, with, with the Grace port. And the Grace port is at the heart a mechanical device that just takes connections from inside the cabinet to the outside of the cabinet. So you don't have to open up uh, the cabinet in order to program, access the PLC, drive connections, and you know other kind of connections inside, uh, inside the device. Helps keep workers safe. And we really created this mass customization model, which was really unique, especially through distribution. But at the heart, our core competency at that point was really more of a mechanical design competency and just understanding the application space. Uh, the next product that kind of came along was our permanent electrical safety devices. And, you know, so we went from a mechanical device to an analog device. And, you know, that was a big, that was a big change in um, understanding because we had to really understand power systems, three-phase power, what's the difference between a delta and a Y system. And really then we started to understand arc flash and all those types of, of uh, issues. And so that kind of set us up into, hey, what's the next area that we need to expand into? Where do we need to develop competency? Where do we think that there's market size and opportunity? Um, and uh, through a conversation with one of our distributors out in uh, Michigan, Mac and Mac, um, you know, I, I, I'm just always curious about who's developing what and what kind of new technologies. And so I was talking uh, with uh, Tim Mulcahy and I said, hey, Tim, so what do you have seen that's new? And he goes, hey, we're doing something really cool at Chrysler. Yeah. So I think that sets you up. Yeah, perfect. And, and I'll go back a little bit uh, back to that 20 ti 2010 timeline as well to talk about kind of where I was as Grace was kind of growing towards this point where predictive maintenance became a product line that's, that was of interest to them. Uh, I was going through a PhD program at the University of Michigan. Uh, we were doing a lot of kind of interesting work at the time, building low cost, low power wireless sensors for monitoring usually civil infrastructure. So bridges, buildings, ships, wind turbines, that sort of thing. You know, we were deploying these little vibration based sensors across, across those assets to try to get early indication of, of failures in those structural systems. And I started a company back in right around 2009, 2010 uh, called Civionics. Uh, we licensed some of that technology out of the university and began looking for kind of a commercial home for it. So I spent that that kind of next five, six years uh, growing that technology in the commercial space, seeing it deployed in a variety of different areas, and eventually uh, ended up working with McNaught and McKay out there in Michigan to deliver some um, uh, some of these devices to to a stamping facility there, a Chrysler stamping facility, and that that led us into the conversation you know, that, that we had with Grace. I, I think that actually that, that story, uh, getting into Chrysler and working with Mac and Mac, I actually think that there's a lot of gold in there. So let's, let's dig in yeah. a little bit deeper. So can you talk about, so you, uh, you, you spun out from University of Michigan, you were doing a bunch of more uh, research type projects that were funded by NSF and, and other government agencies. So walk through that to all of a sudden I'm working on sta in a stamping facility. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit of a, a convoluted story, but but you know we we came at it from the research perspective. So I was able to raise kind of the early rounds of money for for Civionics through uh, research and development grants, uh, largely funded by federal agencies uh, like the Department of Defense, uh, National Science Foundation. Uh, we did some work with the Office of Naval Research, um, and really all of that R and D was. Uh, targeted around building a, a system, right, that could be deployed on any number of engineered assets to detect early stage failure in those systems and then alert the appropriate uh, stakeholder when things went wrong. So we've been working on, on one very exciting grant, I thought, with the Department of Homeland Security, where we were trying to build sensors that could monitor the stability of of buildings as they were either burning or after a terrorist attack or, or um, kind of a fire type event, earthquake, uh, that sort of thing. And you know it, that project, uh, just because of kind of the way the government worked, ended up losing funding. Um, and that that kind of made me pivot the company away from kind of that R and D focus towards finding a commercially fertile area for the technology that we'd been developing. Um, there was a program out there in Detroit called uh, Changing Gears, I think, that was targeted at pulling folks out of the automotive industry that were kind of previously had had kind of had had 
um, kind of entry level positions in the in that industry, and and it was targeted at pulling them out and being able to give them exposure to the entrepreneurial ecosystem that was happening in in kind of Southeast Michigan at at the time. Um, and through that program, uh, we we had kind of in in. Uh, a, a, an exposure to this the stamping plant in, in downtown Detroit. Um, and in discussions with the plant manager there, it became obvious that this technology that we'd been developing for you know, the civil, the structural applications could also be applied to monitor high-valued equipment in the industrial environment. Right, so they, they had had some issues with uh, these these incredibly large gears that were used as part of the stamping process. Um, you know, every time one failed, it was costing millions of dollars to the plant as they had to go out and procure these these incredibly expensive replacements. Um, and they were looking for solutions that could come in and help give them early indication of those problems. Um, so we 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 were able to streamline that technology for that application. Um, our initial foray in there actually targeted. Um, and not vibration, but we were looking at current and, and temperature values uh, that gave them kind of an early return on investment. It was just a simple thing, but it, it allowed them to avoid going around the facility and taking temperature readings once per month. They could instead do it kind of every five minutes, every 10 minutes, however frequently we were doing it at the time. Um, and, and that allowed them to save a significant amount of money just by putting these wireless sensing technologies in, in, into place. Um, you know that that's a that's like an early example, but also these examples still exist today, where there's just like some very easy low hanging fruit. Um, before we kind of get into where we're at today, what were some limitations, like from a development perspective, what were some limitations of the technolo technology kind of back in those early days, and like what were you really fighting with, and and what's changed kind of to now? Yeah, it's a yeah, it's a good question. So. You know, there were, there were a couple of main drawbacks when we roll back the clock to 2010, uh, five years ago in 2010. Um, uh, you know, the first and foremost... You are good at math, I think. I, I, yeah, yeah. That's, that's right. That's what they pay me to do. <laughs> um, so, so uh, we sensing, let's start there. Um, our ability in 2010 to miniaturize sensors was just becoming kind of commonplace. So a lot of the sensing technologies that were required uh, to deploy in large numbers um, at low costs were just kind of becoming readily available to, to the, the masses. Um, we also had a recent improvement in wireless kind of transmission technology. So some of these protocols that are now ubiquitous, things like Bluetooth, uh, we use 802.15.4, which is uh, uh, Zigbee sometimes is what we, we talk about. Um, you know, Wi-Fi wasn't that established at that time. Um, you know, those those wireless communication technologies were just becoming available to the point where it was it was easy to pull them off the shelf and integrate them with with technologies. Um, and then I think the, the the big thing that really drove it was the the cloud ecosystem became available. So all of the big tech players started to emerge with their cloud solutions. Um, you know, Amazon with AWS, Microsoft with Azure. You know, Google had their cloud coming out. So the the time was right in that in that kind of period to start talking about enterprise level deployments of technologies inside the industrial facility that didn't necessarily have to tie into some legacy computing system. We could we could leverage those low cost cloud. Uh, capabilities to give a customer, you know, a low cost way to, to start playing around with this sort of predictive maintenance technology. Yeah, you know, that's, um, that's awesome. So, so kind of going past just the temperature monitoring at Chrysler, what was the next phase of the project? And then, you know, kind of talk through the rest of the evolution. Yeah, so uh, as I'm sure many of the listeners here today know, it, you know, one of the big things that, that comes up anytime you're trying to monitor the integrity or the health of industrial assets is vibration monitoring. And that was really front and center from the beginning of that engagement with Chrysler. Um, you know, we when, when, I, when I came into Grace, Drew and I actually did a, a kind of a road tour <laughs> of a, a bunch of our distributors and, and we're just talking with customers at that time looking at, you know, where does this technology fit best? Where can we make the biggest impact for our customers? Um, and, you know, through that, we really found that we had a couple of main things we needed to focus on to, to provide a 10x improvement in what they had access to. So the first thing there was was vibration, um, and we've got we've got several webinars you can look at if you really want to get into that. So I'm not going to touch. Actually, that we have, we have one of our most viewed webinars is uh, one of the vibration webinars, and it's it's really a uh, 
it's really a masterclass on, you know, uh, if, you're, if you're not fully kind of up on how vibration works on monitoring of defects, and it, there, there's a very specifically defined set of rules in physics that actually, you know, kind of let you know what's happening in on a, on a process, depending on what the system is. Um, if Nick wants to go ahead and drop that into one of the chat links at some point, um, he's shaking his head at me because <laughs> I'm doing, cause I'm doing something on the fly. Um, but, uh, you can go ahead and it is on YouTube and I'll try to get it into the chat link. Hey, Oh, one other thing while I'm talking about the chat, if you have any questions, mm-hmm. I am monitoring the chat. I have my computer up, uh, on me. And so, uh, in front of me, um, and uh, I'll, I'll be looking through those as well. So I'm going to actually, I'll send that link to you guys all out after the webinar in the email. I don't want you guys to all go watch that and leave this <laughs> webinar right now. Yeah. Sorry, uh, shiny object. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yeah. shiny object problem. All, all okay. videos will be available on demand. Yes, so we'll, yes. we can get at them later. Um, but but let me pull on that thread with vibration just, just a little bit. I mean, it, it, it is, you know, any rotational piece of equipment, right? That's in your plant, your motors, your pumps, your compressors. R- vibration is a fundamental technology for being able to give early indication of problems in those assets, right? So, um, you know, a lot of our customers wait until they hear something going wrong, right? The, that something's actually making a noise that a human can hear. That means that probably that asset at that point is, is also hot to the touch. Um, you know, because there's frictional kind of problems occurring that's causing that, that noise. And, you know, we're probably also seeing an increased current draw at that point. So we use temperature and current a lot of times to pull information out. Well, the, the idea behind vibration is that we can leverage vibration way earlier in the process to say, hey, something's going on with, with this asset. And we think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's going to become a problem. Right. So that's that's that was the, the big thing that we got in those kind of early discussions with with our distribution channel, with our customers, was that, look, we needed they needed a targeted solution for vibration monitoring. Um, and I think that was the that was the um, uh, the kind of rallying cry that we had uh, right after kind of uh, uh, Sibionics came into Grace, which was in 2018. Uh, we, we, we kind of skipped over that part, I guess. But um, that was a. Uh, a kind of a, a marriage meant to happen, I think. Grace was looking for a technology partner that could bring them into this this digital transformation age, this era of predictive maintenance. And, and you know, as a small business owner, I was looking for some stability in that industrial space to help with the sales and the marketing efforts. And so it made a lot of sense. Um, so the first the first real product we targeted there. Well, was, uh, I guess I'll, I guess I'll give some from my from my perspective. Yeah. You know, so after I got introduced. Um, we, we, we started working on, on trying to figure out a way to kind of partner together even before we started discussing acquisition. And it became kind of apparent that, you know, I think we were gonna be a lot stronger together. And, and so um, Andy flew out to come and, and meet with us. And uh, it was really, you know, you know we, were, we were very like pleasantly surprised where, you know, I think sometimes PhDs have a little bit of a different, uh, uh, a, a, a stereotype potentially, um, and uh, maybe an ivory tower stereotype. Uh, but what was so impressive about Andy was his ability to actually create product. Um, and I, I want to click on, double click on that for a minute. Creating product in the industrial space, especially when it's digitally enabled, is incredibly difficult, okay? Um, there's a there's a ton of people who can take already created products mm-hmm. and be able to integrate them to create a you know to, to create a system that works. But to really like get voice of customer, develop what the packaging needs to look like, develop what the underlying I/O structures need to be, what the entire architecture really needs to be. This is not like a trivial endeavor and. Um, and then you start to add in all the complexities of the industrial environment, all the different types of applications, um, the environmental conditions. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is going to be, you know, in Canada in the middle of winter, or this is going to be in Texas in the middle of summer. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you start to roll through this, you know, incredibly complex kind of uh, product requirements document. Um, and really creating a product in the industrial space is really challenging. Mm-hmm.